Uh, continuing with this series of videos, reinterpreting sort of uh, the physics, conventional physics, and how it's presented uh, in the lectures of Walter Lewin and such. So let's continue. Today, I'm going to take a critical look at Ampere's law. I'm going to run a current through a wire, as we did before, but now I'm going to also put a capacitor in that line, and so we are, are charging a capacitor. Here is that capacitor. Here is the wire. We're running the current I. And as we're running this current, clearly, we get a changing electric field inside the capacitor. The electric field all right, so again with this changing electric field, just meaning there's a difference, a potential difference, a voltage difference. And the voltage difference requires there to be an exchange. So it's like you could think of it as heat or anything else that's going to be transferred and eventually uh, reaching equilibrium. So it'll keep transferring until equilibrium is reached. And so essentially it's charging a surface that's not charged. Um, and it'll do so until the two plates have an equal voltage. Inside the capacitor, sigma free divided by kappa epsilon zero, which is also Q free divided by the area. This is a circular plate capacitor. Capital R is the radius of that capacitor. So we get pi R squared kappa epsilon zero. But since I run the current, the Q free is building up all the time. And so the current, per definition, is dQ dt. And so I now have an ex a changing electric field inside the dt, which is the current I. So again, it's just a consequence. It's a byproduct of the difference in voltage. <laughs> and that's all. The change is not what's happening. The change is a product of what's happening divided by pi r squared, kappa epsilon zero. Because I simply take the derivative of this equation, I get dq dt, and dq dt is i. And only if the current is zero, is there no changing electric field inside. So how does this affect the magnetic field? So the other thing to keep in mind, this epsilon zero thing combined with the omega whatever thing ends up being the speed of light. So it's that constant is in there sort of indicating as a speed element to how uh, quickly uh, things happen, something like that. But in the end, that's what that stuff is there for, is it's a placeholder for uh, the speed of light. Well, if I take here a point P1 at a distance little r from the wire, if you're far away from this capacitor, it's hard to believe that Ampere's law would not give the right answer. And we'll apply that very shortly, Ampere's law is on the blackboard there. Suppose you are at the same distance from this line here at point P2. Well, yeah, you've got to admit there is an interruption of current now. There is no current going through this space. And so you expect that the magnetic field here would be a little lower, perhaps, than it is here. But not very much. So the question is, how can we now calculate the magnetic field here and there, now that we have this opening in the wire? Well, Bio Savar could handle it, but I wouldn't know how to do it, because if there's a current flowing like this, there's also a current going up on these plates, and one like so. And I wouldn't know how to apply Bio Savar. In principle, yeah, but in practice, no. How about Ampere's law? Well, let's give Ampere's law a shot. This is a cylindrical symmetric problem. So I choose a closed loop, which of course itself is a circle with radius r. And I attach to this closed loop an open surface that's mandatory. And I give myself an easy time. I make it a flat surface. So now I apply Ampere's law. You see it there on the blackboard. Anywhere on that closed loop, the magnetic field will have the same strength for reasons of symmetry. And so we get b times 2 pi r equals mu zero times I pen, and pen means the current that penetrates my open surface. Well, that's I, 
I goes right through that surface. And so the magnetic field at that point, P1, U0 times I divided by 2 pi R. We've seen this several times before. Now I <coughs> Which is partly, it's all constants in a sense. 2 pi is a constant, so the mu zero is a constant, so you really only have I over R again. But whatever. I wonder about P2. Can I apply Ampere's law for point P2? Well, yeah, you can try. So now I attach a closed loop to this point. Circle, again, radius little r. And I use this flat surface. And I apply MP as well. Well, I'm in for a shock. Well, there's no point because it's essentially a battery uh, once it's charged. So once it's charged, there's not going to be anything going through there. So, yeah, what's the point? Because B times 2 pi R is not... And even when it's charging, there's nothing going through there but force. And you're not going to be able to collect it without a collector. It doesn't create a field radially because it's not a conductor. Changing, but there is no current that penetrates that surface. And so I is zero, and so I have to conclude that the magnetic field at point P2 is zero, which is absurd. Couldn't be. Well, obviously, when the capacitor is charging, there is a current going through that, because that distance is really a short distance for a capacitor to charge. So it's not going to charge if the things are too far apart. So obviously, it's spilling charge on the surfaces. I can make the situation even worse. I'm going to revisit point P1. And here is my capacitor. And here is my point P1. My current is flowing like so. Here's my closed loop. According to Ampere's law, int closed loop integral B dot DL. Why should I choose a flat surface? I'm entitled to any surface. I like surfaces like this. They are attached to a closed loop. So I will choose that kind of a surface. The surface now goes like so. Right through the capacitor plates. And I apply Ampere's law. So it's open here. B times 2 pi r. The radius is little r. Mu zero times i. But there is no i going through that surface. Nowhere through this surface is a current poking. Because there is no current going between the capacitor plates. So now I have to conclude that the magnetic field at P1 which we first concluded was this, is now also zero. So something stinks. So Ampere's law is inadequate. Well, I mean, obviously it has to be adjusted for circumstances where you're um, inducing. So, and that's what a capacitor is essentially doing. It's inducing a parallel charge. So, yeah, I mean, technically there's no current going through there, but there's current going through the other side of the wire. So you're still pulling a positive and a negative. So, well, whatever. Seems like um, word games. And so, of course, Faraday and Ampere were both perfectly aware of this. But yet it was Maxwell who zeroed in on this, and he argued that any open surface that you attach to a closed loop should give you exactly the same result, the same answer. And so he suggested that we amend Ampere's law. And so he asked himself the question, what is so special about in between the capacitor plates? Or what is special there that in between the capacitor plates there is a changing electric field. And Maxwell reasoned, gee, Faraday's law tells me that a changing magnetic flux gives rise to an electric field. So he says maybe a changing electric flux gives rise to a magnetic field. And I want to remind you what an electric flux is. Phi of E. No, again, I would argue there's only one field change. All you can do is change the elements of the the stuff that makes this stuff happen in the first place, which is the positive and the negative force. Um, and magnets and electricity both do that in subtly different ways, but it's the same force in the end. It's not two different forces. Is the integral, in this case, it would be an open surface of E dot dA. That is an electric flux. This Gauss law that you see on the blackboard there, we had a closed surface. I'm talking now about an open surface. That is an open surface. This is an open surface. And this is an open surface. And so Maxwell suggested that we have to add a term 
which contains the derivative of the electric flux. And that's what I'm going to do there now, walking over to Ampere's law. I'm going to amend it in the way that Maxwell suggested. He adds a term here, epsilon zero kappa, ddt of the integral over an open surface attached to that closed loop of E dot dA. This current, which is the one that penetrates, remember, through the surface, is really a real current. This term here, Maxwell called displacement current. I want to make sure that I have no slip of the pen, because I hate slips of the pen. That is correct. I have everything in place. You may think now that we can start a party because all four Maxwell's equations are now in place. Not quite. We're going to make one small adjustment after spring break. And that adjustment is going to be made in this one. And then we'll have our party. So now I would like to use the new law and see whether we can clean up that mess. So I'm going to revisit my point P1, and I'm going to apply the new law by first having a flat surface, that surface that we have here, and then trying this surface. And I want to get the same answer. If I use that surface, do we agree that there is a current going through that surface, but there is no electric flux going through that surface? So that second term, that displacement current term, is zero for that flat surface. So this answer is completely valid. Now, I want to pursue this case. So again, it's just you're trying to find ways to organize the variables. And um, you can have, you can choose variables that aren't directly related, but are proportionally related. So they're going to be the same, whether you identify it correct or not, it's still going to be a proportion to the real thing that's happening. So it's in essence, this is just a way of saying that, oh, well, we're just going to pretend, okay, that the inductive, what's being induced is a current, is the same as a current. And then, you know, so all of this, just to basically say, yes, we're going to concede that an induced current is the same as a current. <sighs> Pretty much. And so I make a new drawing. We have here this point, <coughs> P1 really doesn't have anything to do with anything called a flux or any of this kind of stuff. It just has to do with the fact that when you have force radiating of one kind on certain, under certain conditions it will create certain effects. In some conditions it will pressurize all the atoms and they'll become a charge. In other circumstances they'll move the monopoles and you know create a, a magnetism. And so it just depends on how you're going to affect it. Uh, what kind of response it'll do uh, as a consequence and if it's if the charges are free to move then they'll um, likely create a um, opposite response so you, you hit it with the positive force and you get back proton force you hit it with electron force you get proton force back um, and if it's not allowing for there to be a transfer of the pressure, then you'll get the opposite effect, which is you'll hit it with positive force and you'll get positive force back, as in the case of the monopole charging. This is my radius little r. This is my surface going right through here. This is the current I. And so the capacitor creates the obvious circumstance of one side goes positive, the other side therefore goes negative through the medium of the dielectric that's placed in between and um, and um, that's all you need to know here's my changing electric field mm -hmm. and so I get B times 2 pi R U0 I pen is zero there is no current penetrating through this bag this is open here so the first part is zero so I only deal with the second part, which is epsilon zero k, kappa, displacement current. And now I have to put in there d phi e. So displacement current is just induced current. 
dt. Phi e is very easy to calculate because e in the a, right here, think of this part being flat. Wherever you are inside the capacitor, if we assume that there are no fringe fields, then there is an electric field only when you're inside the capacitor. And so the electric flux is simply e times the surface area, e and the a are in the same direction. So this is the electric field times this pi capital R squared. And therefore, if I want to know what the derivative is, then I get this pi R squared, which is that surface area. And now I need there d e d t. And the d e d t we have, that is i divided by pi R squared kappa epsilon zero. i divided by pi R squared kappa epsilon zero. So this is the area A, and this is the EDT, and this is the area of the part inside the capacitor that has a flux going through it. Because outside here, there is no flux going through there. So there's no contribution. There's no contribution here either. There's no contribution here either. The electric field is only existent there. That's my assumption. And so the whole thing... And again, it doesn't have anything to do with the electric field being there. It has to do with the fact that the current from the other side senses the pressure because the pressure is being allowed to um, induce. And so it's pulling as if the two wires were connected when they're not. The thing here is now d phi e dt. Well, let's look at our results. I lose a pi, I lose my r squared, I lose my kappa and epsilon zero, and look what I get. I get mu zero times i. That is truly amazing. So I find now that b equals mu zero times i divided by two pi little r, which is exactly what we had before. Hooray for Mr. Maxwell. Because now it doesn't matter anymore whether you take the flat surface or whether you take the bagged surface. You now get the same answer. In one case, there is no contribution. So, the, right, so the point is he added an inverse component to the equation where, so only one of the two will function in the circumstance. One goes to zero or the other one goes to zero. So there's either an induced element in the function and the induced element becomes an important factor or there's a, a real current. ...from the displacement current term, and in the other case, there's no contribution from the first term, the real current. Let me make sure whether I'm happy with my results. Yeah, I think that's fine. We can now also go one step further, and we can calculate anywhere in between the capacitor what the magnetic field is. I'll make another drawing of the capacitor. It's right here. I have this E field. I will not repeat that every time. And here I have my point P2 now, which is inside the capacitor at a radius little r from the center. And this is capital R, circular plate. I have here my closed loop, the circle, radius little r. I apply now the new law, B times 2 pi r. And there we go. We have a mu zero, we have an epsilon zero, we have a kappa. There's no current going through here, so it's non-negotiable. I pen is zero, right? That's not even an issue. So we get mu zero, epsilon zero, I get kappa. But now the surface area right here is not pi capital R squared, where there is a changing electric field, but it is only pi little r squared. I take a flat surface now. And so now we multiply this by pi little r squared, and then of course the EDT is the same. So we get our current I divided by pi capital R squared divided by kappa epsilon zero. And now you're again losing a lot. You lose your epsilon zero, you lose your kappa. I lose a pi. And look, I have a little r here and I have a little r squared there. So now we're going to get a result, which is something that you may actually have anticipated. Namely, that you get a, a field inside the capacitor that is growing with R. Because if I make up my balance, I get upstairs mu zero times I. But I get one little R upstairs. You see, you have R square here, then you have R here. And downstairs, I get 2 pi, and then I get a K 
capital R squared, and I believe that's correct. Let me check my notes. And yes, I'm happy with that. And this is proportional with little r. Whereas here, falling off 1 over r. And so I can now make a plot of the magnetic field as a function of little r when I'm inside the capacitor plates. Little r, this is the magnetic field, and this is the radius of the capacitor plate. There will be a straight line up to that point, and then it will fall off as 1 over little r. And you can do your homework on that. That is very trivial to calculate, to demonstrate that when you go beyond the edge of the capacitor, that then it falls off as 1 over r, just in the same way that point P1 is doing. So now we have a tool to calculate the magnetic field even inside capacitors while we were charging, which we didn't have before. The strength here... Uh, which I don't know where that would ever be at all useful, <laughs> but whatever. Sorry, this is, you know, it's not much you can do with this. Uh, just a bunch of... Uh, fine, I mean, people need these details, I suppose, but... Um, Frankly, I think the truth of what exactly is happening is hidden in a bunch of constants that don't need to be in these equations in the form they are, and that the whole thing is basically just uh, some proportion of the force escapes and some proportion <laughs> is kept, and that's the what you're transferring. You're just defining how much waste there is in the inducing process. The maximum magnetic field here you find by substituting in there for little r, capital R. And when you do that, if this becomes capital R, this becomes 1 over capital R. If you had substituted in here for little r, capital R, you would have found the same result. This part is not kosher and cannot be correct. And I cannot make it right for you. And the reason why that part cannot be kosher is because we have made the assumption, which is wrong, that there is no fringe field. And so we have assumed in our calculations that the electric field is only here and there, but it's zero here, so that there is nothing, no DEDT here, no changing the electric flux, and that's not true. So clearly, when you get close to the edge, this is not correct. And there's no way I can correct for that, because the fringe fields will be different from capacitor to capacitor. And those calculations, of course, are not even very easy to make. When Maxwell had introduced his displacement current term, he was a very smart man. He predicted that as a consequence of that term, that radio waves should exist. There was a time that we didn't know that radio waves existed. He predicted their existence. Right. So this is sort of bullshit. Um, just because they already knew that light was coming at these different frequencies. And clearly, all you had to do was guess. Like, oh, there's x-rays, there's different, you know, bandwidth. Uh, frequency of light and all you're saying is, is there's got to be a whole bunch of stuff that's still going slower than that <laughs> so he predicted that oh yeah there's stuff going slower than light which isn't much of a prediction in my opinion you know that there's something of a smaller frequency we know there's stuff at a higher frequency that's invisible why wouldn't we think there's stuff at a lower frequency that's invisible seems kind of obvious so I, I don't think some of these descriptions of of history, um, I'm just not too sure that's exactly how it happened. But not only did he predict their existence, he even was able to calculate what their speed was going to be. We call that the speed of light. Right. Now, the speed is built into Maxwell's equations already with that epsilon zero stuff and that mu zero thing. Those two numbers multiplied times each other end up being the speed of light. So clearly those constants were chosen um, because they end up adding up to the speed of light. So it was already built into the equation when those those constants were chosen. Right. And we will do that in a few weeks ourselves in 802. In 1879, which was the year that Maxwell died, the German physicist Helmholtz asked one of his students, Hertz, he was 22 years at the time, he was a junior, to try to demonstrate that radio waves indeed exist. Hertz declined because he argued that the equipment that was available at the time was not good enough. But seven years later, when new 
equipment had been developed, he accepted the challenge. And it took him two years, but then he indeed was able to demonstrate that radio waves do exist. Imagine what a victory that was. So, uh, seven years, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a long time, um, in a sense, for something that, you know, but the, the trick is detecting, because um, we don't have an innate mechanism, so you have to figure out how to create an oscillator before you can really detect radio waves. You have to have some way to tune them, because we don't have an innate, there's no innate tuner. <sighs> Fact. Like Maxwell who predicts out of nothing that radio waves should exist. So it wasn't out of nothing. So again, this idea that it was out of nothing. It wasn't out of nothing. We already knew the light was doing this frequency thing. We, why wouldn't you think there's a whole band below these very tiny frequencies? There'd be all kinds of other frequencies. It's, it's completely reasonable to assume the existence of such things. From someone who actually shows that they do exist. Hertz died five years after his great experiments. He was 37 years old. He was very young. And he lived 10 more years. There's no doubt in my mind that he would have been awarded with the Nobel Prize for Physics. But the first Nobel Prize was only given in 1901. So he died just a little bit too early. Maxwell also died very young, age 48. Why did Maxwell call that strange term placement current? In the presence of a dielectric, if you put a dielectric in there, the changing electric fields will indeed cause a current in between the plates. Because the polarization will change all the time. You get a, re a rearrangement of these induced charges. So there is indeed a current. But in vacuum, there shouldn't be any current. Any electric field changing or not changing will not cause a current in vacuum. But Maxwell believed that vacuum in a way behaves like any other dielectric, just a special dielectric, happened to be a dielectric with kappa equals one. And so he really believed that there was an actual current going between the plates, even though we now know, of course, that that is not the case. So the main displacement current was... So again, it's induction, it's a force that's going, and uh, what else can be said about it? You know, the force goes through the vacuum. You can't send electrons through the vacuum, but you can send the force through the vacuum. Mm, something like that. Perhaps not a very lucky one, but the term is a must. And it completes the theory of electricity and magnetism. Just like magnetism. We know magnetism goes through just about anything. There's no, nothing can stop magnets from working. The vacuum's not going to stop magnets from working. The force being radiated is you know, pervious to everything, just like gravity. The name is obviously of no consequence. After all, Shakespeare said it himself in Romeo and Juliet, what's in a name? Remember, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Those were the words by Shakespeare. I will have... Who cares? <laughs> abandoned for now the displacement current, but we will revisit it later when we will deal with radio waves and with the propagation of electromagnetic radiation. And I will return now to good old Faraday. So again, the propagation of radiation is the way it should be said. Electromagnetic is just makes it confusing. It's one kind of radiation. And um, you can just have different forms in the sense you can send it at a frequency or you can send plus or minus radiation. And I will return to the electric generators that run our economy. We've discussed this at length, and I want to revisit that to you, with you. Remember that if you rotate conducting loops in magnetic fields, that you create induced EMFs, currents, and that keeps our economy going. The wire captures the force, simple enough. Force is being radiated like light, and a certain amount of light will hit the wire. The wire will collect it and be impacted by it, changed by it. Voltage created. Here is again one of those loops. Conducting wire. And I don't care about the direction of the magnetic field. If you want it this way, that's fine. What matters is that we're going to rotate it about this axis. 
And as we rotated about this axis, we're going to get an induced EMF. And that induced EMF, which we derived, I think it was last lecture, as a function of time, will be a sinusoidal or a cosinusoidal curve, and therefore will look something like this. I call this loop number one, and so this is the EMF produced by loop number one. But now, I'm going to add two more loops, which are not electrically connected, physically separate. If you look from this direction, you will see the following. This would be your loop number one, because you're looking in this direction and you would only see the conducting wire like so. I have now a second one, which is rotated 120 degrees, and so in this picture, you will see it like so. Loop number two, and this is 120 degrees. Physically 120 degrees rotated. And then I have a third one, which is again 120 degrees rotated, which is like so. And so this angle here is also 120 degrees, and so this angle is 120 degrees. And this is my loop number three. And so each one of those will give an EMF that has this shape, but they are offset now in phase by 120 degrees. And so they're all rotating in exactly the same way, like so. And so the second one will give me an EMF, if I try to estimate that roughly, something like this. So this is loop number two. So they'll all be in a different phase of the circle. So they'll be in different distance from the magnetic field at a particular time, a set difference in their distances. Comes a little later in time. And number three will again be offset. Will look like this. Number three. And what we, we call this a three phase current. And the three-phase current can produce a rotating magnetic field. We will make one for you, but I'll first explain to you how that works. So if the period of number one is 60 hertz, then the period of number two is also 60 hertz, and number three is also 60 hertz, but they're just offset in terms of the phase angle. Suppose you're looking down onto a horizontal table. So this is a horizontal table. And I have here a solenoid. This is one and the same solenoid. When the current runs clockwise here, it will also run, to run clockwise there. But it's open here. So you put something in there. We call this number one. Then I have another one which is rotated, physically rotated 120 degrees. It's here. Also coils. And I'm going to feed current number two through those coils later. Through those coils. This is number two. And I have a third one, and I'm going to run current number three through those. So here are coils, here are coils, this is number three. And so one sees current number one, two sees current number two, and three sees current number three. At the moment that the current through number one reaches a maximum, the current in two and three are down by a factor of two. You can check that for you. During my lecture, I went a little bit too fast over the part that is coming up now. So I'm going to redo it a little slower to make it more clear. All right. So maybe we'll do the same. Wait till next time to take on the three-phase motor thingy. So it just makes sense in the sense that instead of... I mean, you're just optimizing. So you're taking advantage of the fact that you don't have to do this all the way on and then turn the motor, the full power off while it's in the wrong position, turn it back on again. So you're just doing it in steps, and those steps allow you to get more um, push. <laughs> you can push more often, uh, however you want to say it, through the cycle. You can take advantage continuously of the ability to push by changing where the making the pushing happening at the same at the point where the thing is available to be pushed where there's stuff to push it's probably a better way to say that but anyway tired blah 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 excuses 
So anyway, um, yeah, sorry, it's just not a, it's not a subject where you can get into much fundamental conversation beyond the fact that this isn't about uh, EMF. It's just about every time you run a current, you pressurize atoms, you charge them, they change how the force, they interact with it. So the force comes in, like I said, gravity, black and red mixed evenly, and you'll start reflecting it unevenly. That is, all the black gets reflected, most of the red doesn't, and so you become a, uh, a black object. Just, it's about, if you think of it in terms of light, and understanding that you could say it, there's two kinds of light, up light and down light, or some other way to say it besides just color, um, you just understand there's a different proportion of, of brightness and um, it might be another way to say it or, or you can think of it in color and you could just say that on is uh, you know the, the electron force is the blue and the proton force is the red and you're really just reflecting more blue or more red and um, based on the fact that you've been changed so how your change changes what you reflect to the rest of the world and what you reflect ends up being essentially what you impose on somebody else and change them by imposing it on them <laughs> and um, they might be imposing back on you and that's induction so anyway uh, till the next edition and such